and thanks to all of you for, for tuning in, for joining us today. We are really excited. We've got a wonderful panel, really a dream team of panelists. And I am so pleased that all, all four of them were able to join us today. <clears throat> um, so I, I, my goal is really to um, introduce each of the panelists and ask them the questions and, and then join the rest of you in keeping my mouth shut and listening because they've, they've got some great responses and some great information to share with us. So I'm gonna jump right in and start introducing our panelists um, in alphabetical order. First, we have Dr. Dominique Brassard. Uh, Dominique Brassard is a professor and chair of the Department of Life Sciences Communication at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She teaches science and risk communication and has published extensively on her research, which focuses on the intersection of science, media, and policy. She is currently part of a project which is conducting a national survey to gauge public knowledge of COVID-19 and will use the results to design a social media campaign to encourage healthy behaviors. Dominique has an MS in plant biotechnology and a PhD in communication from Cornell University. Our next panelist is Cheryl Kirschenbaum. Cheryl Kirschenbaum is a science writer and communicator who co-authored Unscientific America, How Scientific Literacy Threatens Our Future. She co-directs Michigan State University's Food Literacy and Engagement Poll and moderates MSU's Our Table Community Conversations. Cheryl Kirschenbaum also hosts the PBS digital series, Serving Up Science, and co-hosted the NPR podcast by the same name. She has served as a science fellow in, US, in the US Senate and has been a blogger at Scientific American, Wired and Discover. Kirschenbaum is director and co-founder of Science Debate, a nonprofit organization dedicated to elevating science policy issues in the national dialogue. She holds two master's degrees in science and public policy from the University of Maine. Next, we have Mary McKenna. I'm sorry, Marin McKenna. Marin McKenna is an independent science writer and journalist and a senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University. Her books include Big Chicken, Superbug, and Beating Back the Devil on the Front Lines with the Disease Detectives of the Epidemic Intelligence Service. She is currently writing for Wired about the coronavirus pandemic and has contributed pieces on public health, global health, and infectious disease to the New York Times, Scientific American, The Atlantic, and National Geographic, to list just a few. She, has worked, she worked for 10 years at the Atlanta Con Journal-Constitution, where she was the only US journalist assigned to full-time coverage of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She has received numerous awards for her writing, including the 2019 AAAS Kavli Award for her piece in the New Republic entitled The Plague Years on how the rise of right-wing nationalism threatens public health. Marin has a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern University and has held postgraduate fellowships at the University of Michigan and MIT. And last but not least, we have Dr. Dietram Scheufele, uh, Dietram is the Taylor Bascom Chair in Science Communication and the Vilas Distinguished Achievement Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Currently, he's also serving as a co-chair of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication Research and Practice. He is considered one of the world's experts in science communication and has won numerous awards for both research and teaching. Dietram holds a master's degree and a PhD in journalism and mass communication, both of which he earned at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So those are our four panelists. I'm really delighted to have them. Um, we are gonna jump right into the questions and I do wanna mention quickly, um, we had over 700 people sign up to participate in this webinar. Most of you asked questions. I'm gonna do my best to get to all of them in the next hour. I don't know if we'll be able to answer all 700 questions, but we'll give it our best shot. Um, so with that, I wanna go ahead and start. Um, and, and the way I'd like to start is the following, because there's so much negative information in the news right now, I'd like to start with something positive. So to all of our panelists, and I'll call on you to respond to this, what are some examples of how the science around COVID-19 has been communicated effectively, yielding positive outcomes? or Name some individuals or organizations that seem to be doing a good job of communicating co coronavirus and COVID-19 information and what has been so effective about their strategies. 
Um, and Deepchand, let's start with you since you're first up on my screen. Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, all for having us. Um, I, I think there's a couple things really quickly. I mean, one, and I know other people will touch on this. I think some of the behavioral outcomes we've actually managed reasonably well um, about flattening the curve of, of people engaging in in, in behavior, behavior that's not just individually, but also socially responsible. That's one thing. And I think partly that's an outcome, and that's my second point here, um, of us having folks in the journalism world, and Marin being among them, um, but I, other people, um, uh, uh, Helen Branswell at STAT, for instance, who, who've, who've devoted their career to thinking about the flu, to thinking about infectious diseases. Uh, and that kind of knowledge, we wouldn't be able to create on the spot if we had to right now. Um, so I'm really glad we're having it. I'm really glad these people are active on Twitter and are sharing information and are being a resource for people out there. Great, thanks. What about you, Dominique? Can you give us a success story so far? Yeah, I mean, I would actually, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I would first to reinforce what Dietram is saying. I have studied SARS H1N1 and different pandemic, and I have to say that right now we see a, a core of journalists uh, uh, you know, coming together to provide the best reporting. So although we do see bad reporting, we see a lot of excellent reporting. As far as a success story, I would say what happens at the grassroots level has to be uh, 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 outlined as well. Here in Madison, we see a, a, a task group coming together with the local department of public officials, with university, with uh, the League of Wisconsin municipalities, with uh, advertising companies that are putting you know, their job pro bono, and with people like me working together at the Dade County level to try to make a difference and, and, and bring uh, protective measures and behavior change. And I think we've been successful, at least if we see the numbers in Wisconsin, and not in Wisconsin, actually, Milwaukee is not good, but Dane County has seen, you know, like that flattening curve uh, process going uh, pretty fast. And I, I credit all my partners having been putting their efforts together on the ground right away. Great, thanks. Marin, what's a, a, who or what is a positive that you would um, cite from uh, regarding science communication right now? Oh, along with everybody else, I have to say first, thank you so much, Duke, for hosting this. Thank you for inviting me. It's a thrill to be on this remote panel with three people whom I just respect so much. It's almost axiomatic uh, in science journalism that when a big event is happening, you want to be hearing from the scientists. And, and we can talk later about whether that's happening and that you don't. Part of the axiom is that you don't want to hear from politicians. So it's been really amazing to me to see how well some politicians are communicating this. Uh, I'm particularly impressed by the governor of New York and the governor of California, Andrew Cuomo and Gavin Newsom, who have done just an amazing, I'm sorry, Newsom isn't the, is he the governor or the mayor? Yes. Anyway, Gavin, thank you. Um, anyway, Andrew Cuomo, Gavin Newsom, let's forget about their titles. Uh, they are both doing such a good job of communicating clearly and directly to their populations, um, both the seriousness of what's going on in those areas, but also that they are, the things that they're asking their populations to do are having an effect. And that to me is such an interesting, well calibrated um, form of communication. I'm asking you to do hard things, but I trust you to, to make a difference for your fellow citizens. So to me, those two really have been a bright spot. Great, thank you. And we have gotten several hundred questions already about whether politicians should be involved in this dialogue. So I'm sure that's gonna come up again at some point in the next hour. Um, Cheryl, how about you? Can you cite um, a, a sort of success story of science communication over the last month or two? Sure, and of course, first, thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. It's so important and so, valuable to be able to continue having these conversations um, in this very strange period of time. Um, to jump off what Marin said, another example of someone who I've been really impressed with is our governor here in Michigan. And you probably know Michigan's been hit very hard by the coronavirus and uh, we still have a long way to go to get out of this. But uh, she has been very direct talking to constituents here, um, talking to the children of the state about it, keeping it relatable and light enough where she put out a video that she told the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy they're still essential workers during this cri uh, crisis. So making us all feel part of this. But a few other examples I want to highlight aside from what Dietram said about Helen is um, I think 
people like Ed Young and Alexis Madrigal at The Atlantic going on NPR, talking about this in a very relatable way. Tara Smith, epidemiologist and a science writer who's fantastic at Kent State, writing in places like Self Magazine that reaches a lot of people not already looking for those scientific sources. Of course, Carl Zimmer at The New York Times has been doing amazing writing. Scam, uh, Sam Scarpino at uh, Northeastern University, wonderful epidemiologist who has been everywhere. And I can't forget Carl Bergstrom, who has been really countering a lot of misinformation about COVID-19 in extremely valuable ways right now. So there's so many people, but those are just a few of the folks that I'm following and I encourage viewers to take another look at if they're not already following as well. Great, thank you all for, the, for those great responses. And um, it's nice to hear that there, is, there are positives out there to discuss. Um, now we're going to go dark, <laughs> um, not too dark, hopefully, but, um, but I want to take a step back from what we just discussed and say, in general, how much, or ask, how much of the current information really is accurate and being effectively communicated? Do you think the media are mostly doing a good job? What about the government officials? And again, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, but are, are they doing, the ones that are um, communicating, we heard from Marin and, and from Cheryl and a couple others that, that some of them are doing a really good job. What about the entertainers and the athletes and the members of the general public that are being very vocal about this? Um, how, how well are people doing in general at communicating? Is there more good information out there or bad information out there? Um, and let's go in reverse order now. So Cheryl, we'll start with you. Well, it's hard to answer that question with a broad brushstroke because there has been some incredible science communication about the coronavirus, but it also arrived at a time when misinformation spreads as quickly, if not faster than the virus. And so we do have this flood of amateur analysts, uh, science that gets politicized, which I follow closely, uncertainty, confusion about the scientific process, cognitive, bi bi uh, cognitive bias, incomplete data. Um, I'm thinking of so many things. We, we've certainly had a lot of inconsistent messaging from leadership and all of these factors combined make it very hard to say we're doing a great job broadly on science communication. And then you have people like Alex Jones of InfoWars promoting his own conspiracy theories that this is a biological weapon and trying to sell vitamin cures, which makes no sense and I've also seen unfounded theories that COVID-19 is linked to the 5G wireless signals and GMOs. Um, and there's also been a growth in the anti-vaccination groups uh, because of this virus and so much misinforma uh, misinformation and manipulation of science. So I think it's a really mixed bag. Uh, I've seen some great stuff. I have a lot of concerns. Yes, definitely. Maren, how about you? I definitely have to echo the lot of concerns. <clears throat> so as Dietram kindly mentioned, I, I have been uh, covering outbreaks and epidemics and disasters for a while. And one of the challenges, whenever something like that happens, any kind of fast moving, <clears throat> excuse me, fast moving news event, is that it's just so hard to keep up with the fire hose of information. Uh, and that is true when you have credible sources. Now we have this crazy mix of both credible sources and highly biased sources and sources uh, just sort of entering into the discourse sort of for the fun of it. And I, I think we are in danger of having the good science sort of drowned out by the biased noise. The, the one thing that I have noticed rising to the top that I find so uh, encouraging and that I think a lot of people are listening to is that particularly on social media, particularly on Twitter, there's a lot of first person storytelling mm -hmm. happening around aspects of this epidemic, particularly by physicians, particularly in New York City, Craig Smith is a great example. Um, uh, when people are able to get their personal stories of the impacts of COVID out to the broad audience of Twitter, I feel as though that's really making a difference. It's really cutting through the, the competing claims of uh, different, uh, let's say, political stances in particular. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dominique, how about you? Yeah, well, I would echo what Marine and Sherry were saying, that uh, it's uh, difficult to reach a broad conclusion what's going on. And we need to remember something that is crucial in the 23rd century of information climate. It's like we all see different things. 
So some of us may be actually exposed to, let's say, good information about this. Others, because of their social network on different social media platforms, will see very different things. So this is something that we need to take into account. People that are on Twitter may not be actually the ones that actually share information on Facebook. Uh, who people find credible is uh, something that we need to think about as well. And I'd like to come back to a statement before when we were saying, should politicians be source of information or not? Well, it depends if they're trusted or not. Let's think of Angela Merkel right now in Germany. She's an ex ex extremely spokesperson for Germans. She's trusted. They know that she's trying to keep them safe. In other uh, uh, states, governors are going to be trusted information. But I would say the good news overall, as far as our research has shown, is local public officials are local health officials are extremely trusted by the community on the ground so i think we need to actually you know like give like a mixed picture of what's going on and not just say there's bad information that they're uh, you know uh, impacted people we need to try to reach people where they are with sources that they trust and i think it's still time to do so thank you and deep from what do you think is there more good information out there right now or bad information it, can I? Yeah, and, and I, earlier you gave a jury, you gave a long list of people, you know, who, who might or might not be doing a good job. Um, I think in that list should also be the scientific community. Um, and I think that's uh, Aransky, Ivan Aransky and Adam Marcus have, have wrote a really good piece in, in Wired, where they basically said, look, what will happen is that most of the information we have, um, the science that's being done right now on COVID will turn out to be wrong, or at least a good chunk of it. Uh, we're right now, we're, we're re referencing preprints, we're, we're waving things through peer review really, really quickly. Uh, we're having small ends um, and, and, and the scientific community is in a bad spot. Absolutely. We have to do something in an unbelievably compressed time frame. That is, that is unprecedented almost. There's lots of pressures, political, financial, otherwise, and everybody's trying to get that elusive vaccine. Um, but I think it also means that we need to realize as we're communicating signs, a lot of the stuff that we're putting out there is not truth. Um, that is always true. Uh, that is not a new phenomenon. But in this case, I think it's a pretty acute problem. Um, and I think that's one thing that, that is, a, that is a, a, a very unique challenge about this particular um, uh, 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 crisis. I think what we'll see in the end, for instance, um, and this is again the, the, the crossover to politics, if we end up coming in well below the estimates, I'm, I think everybody in this panel, everybody who's listening in, is hoping that that will happen, that we come in well below the death estimates. Um, but of course, there will be statements from politics that will say, look, that means it was exaggerated. That means your estimates were wrong. That means the science was bad going into this. And of course, it doesn't mean that. It means that the science communication was really, really effective. And we managed to avoid the, the worst case scenario. But I think we need to already think ahead for how these things play out. A, acknowledge the shortcomings that we are having in our system for producing immediate results that are reliable and, and will, will hold in the long term. And then number two, I think um, um, being ready for what that post-COVID discussion will look like about why estimates were hopefully uh, lower than, uh, why, or the, the estimates were higher, but why the real numbers are hopefully lower than the initial estimates were. Great, thank you, Dietram. Um, so let's stick with this for a little bit longer. Let's stick with this idea of communicating good science versus bad science. Um, and, and let's start with the journalists here. Um, tough question, maybe impossible to answer, but um, how can scientists and science communicators ensure that the good science is communicated while trying to combat the spread of bad information? Marin, um, do you want to start with that? So I think you know, the, the piece of advice I would have or, or the thing that I would like to see happen is that when people have good science to communicate, that they choose their channels carefully. Um, for journalists, that of course means we want the scientists to come to us, to the trusted journalists, but it doesn't necessarily have to, uh, have to be journalists. I think one of the really interesting communication initiatives of the past couple of weeks was Dr. Tony Fauci choosing a sports star to do a, a live video chat with, I think it may have been Stephen Curry. Um, that sports star has a massive online footprint that a journalist couldn't help, couldn't, couldn't hope to match. Um, he speaks to people who, who would never read my stories or, or watch this uh, video call. Um, that was 
a good source to trust. Uh, and that got science out to people who would never otherwise have received it. So I, even if it's not necessarily journalists, I hope people are thinking with care about what channels they're going to use to put their science out there. Thanks. And Cheryl, what about you? Any, any thoughts on how to get um, how scientists and science communicators can sort of push more good commun science communication and trying to fight the bad science that's out there? It's a great question. And I agree with everything Marin just said. I think that credibility is very important, but we also need to think about identifying common values and experiences and language, um, being relatable, working from a place of trust. So maybe building trust, not just during the crisis, but thinking about who that audience is and when you're communicating with them outside of a pandemic, uh, thinking about where your audience is coming from. And probably the most important piece is if, if the situation allows it, I mean, not just with the writing that we do, but uh, offering an opportunity to ask questions and um, taking a lot of time to listen to the concerns that the audience has before you go out there and try to tell a story. Great, thank you. Dietram and Dominique, you both study science communication and what works and what doesn't work. So what are your perspectives on how to get more good science out there while combating the bad science? So I'll start. Um, uh, Cheryl and Marin are right on target with their approach. Uh, so like spokespersons matter, the way you talk to audiences matter, and uh, how you connect uh, whatever you want to communicate to the reality of people's life. So it actually can be relevant to the, the experience on the ground will be actually extremely important. But so we stepping back a little bit, we should think what we think is good science for us might not be good science for others. So, and that's, I think, the idea that we always think we know what people need to know. And we call that the deficit knowledge approach in science communication. This is true in this pandemic as well. Do people need to know every minute how many people die in Italy right now and what's happening? No, they don't. What they need to know is actually protective measures that work in the community that keep them safe, them and their loved one, and what works. And therefore, once you have identified what do people actually need to know, asking them, what would they make them feel safe? What would make them feel that they can accomplish what's expected from them is the starting point. And then we can find the science that may actually help us do this. And I'll, I'll add to that uh, just one thought that, that I think is also worth um, pondering a little bit more for, for all of us in this community. And that's the idea that people are, differenti are influenced very differentially and impacted by this virus and by the measures that we're putting in place. Uh, the Times early on ran a really good piece on, on showing who is who is distancing and who is not, who is working from home and who cannot afford to work from home either because their job doesn't allow them to do that um, or their socioeconomic status. And I think it's a this is a virus that that maybe biologically and even there it's unclear um, affects us similarly, um, but certainly socially affects us very very differently. And so the communication, any communication that doesn't acknowledge that. Um, um, of, of the science or what the implications are of that science, I think is, is bound to fail. And frankly, it's not something that we should be engaging in if, if some groups are affected out there, more or less than others. I think we, we really do need to find a way to, to, to structure our communications around that. Great, thank you all for, for doing a great job answering a very tough, probably unanswerable question. Um, I wanna change tack a little bit and I wanna talk about um, something that I think caught people's attention very early on and in this pandemic, and that's the flatten the curve hashtag and the image that I think we're gonna, um, Ben's gonna put it up on the screen now. I'm sure everyone who's on this call has seen this image many, many, many times, um, but I just wanna remind you all of the image I'm talking about. So this image um, very quickly became sort of an iconic image of the pandemic, um, and as did the hashtag flatten the curve. Um, it's it's very simple, but it seemed to be very effective, right. and um, people seem to understand the message. So um, let's start again with the the science communication researchers now. Um, Dietram, can you talk about what it is about this image and the hashtag that enabled them to get so much traction and become key components of the effort to communicate crucial scientific information to the public? Sure, um, absolutely. And I think there's two things about this model, right? One is is a good model um, illustrates something that's hard to say in words and hard to explain or maybe complex to explain. 
And I think everybody understood intuitively, they don't understand the, the area under the normal curve. They don't understand the mathematics behind it, but they understand the visual representation of that. Um, and it also, I think, did something that we, that we have done very unsuccessfully for vaccines and for infectious diseases in the past, and that is get across the idea of a social responsibility. It's not just about you vaccinating so you don't get sick, it's us working together so we develop, develop herd immunity that we don't overburden, in this case, the healthcare system, and so on and so forth. The one cautionary note, um, and I would love to do research on this, hopefully somebody is already, um, the curve, the blue curve, of course, will not look like this. The blue curve will be bimodal. There will be another valley to that curve, um, and that will differ regionally and so on and so forth. forth. So to which degree we've, we've now imprinted into, into our public consciousness a curve that will not play out that well is a different question. I, this is not to take away from the success of this particular piece of communication, but I think it's the next question that we should ask. Great. Dominic, what about you? What are your thoughts on why this became such an iconic image? Well, I think that we need to ponder when we say it became an iconic image, is it became an iconic image among whom? Like we're taking for granted again that you know this is like you know in the consciousness of the whole the majority of Americans, some research that we've done recently that we haven't published yet, so grain of caution, seems to say that actually people don't really it doesn't really resonate for people. This is again something that disconnected. It's some model that represents something that's not actually present in the community. And as a matter of fact, when you look at people that are not uh, uh, practicing physical distancing right now, they seem to think that that model is something that doesn't really represent reality. So I would say another caution when we think that this is something that uh, we represent the conscious of Americans. I think why Americans are practicing physical distancing is because they're stuck at home with like, you know, like a very uh, uh, stringent measures everywhere. And this is great. But on the other hand, the, 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 the fact that uh, the model in itself is changing how people behave, we, we should also be careful about, you know, uh, reaching conclusions for which we don't have empirical evidence. Great, thanks. Marin or Cheryl, do either of you have anything to add to this discussion of the flatten the curve hashtag and image? I looked into the, the um, evolution, I guess, of this image a bit uh, a little while ago when it started to get some penetrance. And it's really fascinating to me the, uh, the many iterations that this went through. Uh, it, it's, it, it dates back to uh, a visualization of the experience of two different cities in the 1918 pandemic, one that took social distancing measures and one that did not. Uh, it was seized upon in just in the past couple of months by someone, and I was just trying to find his name because I know we had a conversation on Twitter, um, who redrew it into most of what you just showed. Then I believe Carl Bergstrom in Seattle picked it up and added the healthcare capacity line to make it clear that what we were talking about was reducing um, or was flattening the curve to the point that the system could handle. And then I think Susie Wiles may have animated it so people could see that that sharp curve actually could be bent into the lower curve. Uh, that is a fascinating evolution and a really great example of how uh, people are actually doing science and science visualization together on social media in the midst of this to help each other that I find really reassuring. The one thing that um, I'm a little concerned about with the penetrance of this image is that uh, what's not clear unless you look at it closely is that the actual case count doesn't change. Um, but what it does is it, uh, it, it doesn't actually reduce the incidence of the disease. It just spreads it out over a longer period of time. Now that's great for healthcare capacity, but I think that when people look at it, they are thinking, oh, if, we, if, I, if I practice social distancing, if I do the right things, it will somehow make this better. But, and that's true, but only in a very specific definition of better, which is that it might keep hospitals from breaking down, but it might not necessarily keep, a, 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 might not cause a lesser number of people to be ill. Yes, um, and you mentioned that sort of evolution of the image. You, you forgot to mention the pinnacle of the evolution, which was the catening the curve version of that, where people looked at how cats will yes, not overwhelm our health system. So I think that needs to be mentioned as well. Um, Cheryl, how about you? Thoughts on this image and why it got so much traction so quickly? Yes, I mean, I think everything that Dietram and Dominique and Merritt have said is true. I would also add, aside from being a rather simple visual, it also provides a story. 
Uh, we all care about our families and our communities. We care about our healthcare workers. We're at a point in this pandemic where many are feeling helpless and it's actionable. We can do something to help. Uh, we can stay home. We're contributing our part. And I think that in itself is also motivation to tell this story and to say this is something. So we're not at home feeling like we can't do anything and we're just stuck. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask an audience question. This was one that was submitted by one of the people viewing this webinar. And I think it's really relevant to the conversation we just had about that image. Um, the question is images versus prose in media, which is more impactful? And perhaps we should start with the journalists on that one. So Cheryl? I, I'm never good at answering these because my answer is always it depends. <laughs> yeah. if, we're, if we're talking pandemic, uh, the simple visual did get more people to recognize that maybe staying home would make a difference. But of course, there are all the associated problems with that. And we're in fact already seeing people pointing to the lower than expected mortality rates and saying the scientists were wrong. Um, but it really depends. And we're all learning things in different ways. So what works best for some audiences isn't going to be as effective elsewhere. So I'm sorry, it's not a very direct answer, but it depends. Maren, what do you think about that, that question? Uh, I think I have to go with Cheryl. We're spending a lot of time um, uh, agreeing with each other on this panel. <laughs> I hope that's not disappointing to you. We should be fighting more. Um, there are some aspects of this situation that various kinds of images are uniquely suited for. Uh, and that's the flatten the curve uh, graphic. It's the graphics about how to appropriately wash your hands, which became their own kind of meme. But also photography, right? The, the photographs of completely empty international landmarks of you know, healthcare workers collapsing outside the door of an ER in exhaustion, uh, the drone photography in the past 24 hours of uh, graves being pre-dug in the potter's field in New York. Those have a direct emotional impact that I don't think, as much as, much as I am a, a writer of words, I don't think words for the most part are going to carry that emotional punch in the same way. And so we definitely need images, but, uh, I, you know, I think I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> I have some other things to say about images, but I would like to hear from the academics about it first. Right. So Dietram and Dominique, from a research perspective, a science communication research perspective, what do we know about the impact or the power of image versus words? So I think one of the things, I'll go first this time, um, the, uh, the, one of the things that I think is really important when we're talking about impact is what are we trying to do? And that's the first question that anybody would ask in science communication. Are we trying to change behaviors, which is a good chunk of what we're trying to do? Are we trying for people to, to get people to learn the scientific facts surrounding this? Or are we trying to have a, a broader debate about what COVID is doing to our society? Uh, we had a discussion this week, for instance, uh, where, the, where the Trump administration floated the idea that we should have a, a national real-time reporting system of people checking into hospitals um, with the diagnosis that comes along with that. Um, and all the privacy implications, the, the, the constitutional questions, the parallels to 9-11 and so on that, that came from that. So the political, the social, the ethical, the, the regulatory questions that come along with that um, and so on. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to have that last debate? Are we trying to change behaviors? Are we trying to... Um, to, to, to just uh, pull people in. And I think different types of communication, images in particular, are really good at getting people to, to pay attention to a story, get them, basically get something highly complex across um, and, 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 and build that first connection. But the plural of anecdote is not data. So in other words, at some point, we need to have that broader discussion um, that, that, that will require words, uh, to which degree we do want to have a, 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 a reporting system that tracks people's cell phones, da cell phone data, to see how close they were with Bluetooth or whatever other technology to other people who were infected using apps and other things. What that means for what kind of society we're going to live in after this is all over. So I think depending on what the outcome is, there are different tools. Visuals certainly are are a great way of pulling people in and getting a, a, a point across really well um, initially. But I think for that. This is a complex issue. This is not just a behavioral issue. This is not just a knowledge issue. This is a knowledge that has, as we now know, we're all sitting here from our homes, having disrupted what has been our life for the last, I don't know how many years. 
Um, and, and I think this shows us how complex this an issue that is and how complex a discussion it will require down the road and actually starting now for that matter. Thanks. And Dominique, do you have anything to add to this idea of um, images versus prose and the power of that in communication? Well, I will, <laughs> I will echo with Marine was saying we all agree, which is great, but it makes not for well, not a very interesting panel. Like the, the idea is that, you know, as Shai was saying, it depends. And as Dietrich was saying, what's the goal? And as Marine was saying, you know, like it's all in the big context of what's happening right now. What we tend to, to forget here is that we dealing with a constantly evolving global uh, issue that influences cultures and economic sectors and individuals in a wide range of settings for a wide range of pot potential outcomes and so on. So we're not actually designing an advertising campaign with the goal to sell shoes where very easily we would triangulate, choose our media channels, look at the visual that actually, you know, uh, 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 have so, a specific emotion to, you know, encourage people to go to a website and deal with them. So there's a lot that we know about how to do campaigns. There is a lot of research in marketing and advertising that tell us so we can triangulate and use the power of different medium and different type of text or image and so on to have uh, you know things uh, change in society so this is not the case and to some extent i think we don't have the luxury to have that conversation we don't have the luxury to think about this now we all should do what we do best so let's do researchers let's try to get out there and find science communication insights do we uh, you know like writers do what you do not marine continue doing the good work like advertising that know how to use images we need to do it and and, and let's try to coordinate as much as possible because at the end of the day the one thing that actually is resonating with people is do your part, we're all on this together. So let's continue to do that, right? And put all those uh, potential channels, images, text out there to actually raise awareness, change behavior, and continue conversation that at the end of the day put us in a position after the crisis. We keep on talking about the crisis. After the crisis, where are we as society? And I think this is what we need to think about. Well, thank you all. Um, I want to ask another question that was submitted from the audience. This is actually a question. We've got many versions of this, many variations of this. So my question is sort of an amalgamation of those. Um, we heard from lots of early career scientists and science communicators, uh, people who signed up for this and asked questions, including postdoctoral fellows, graduate students, and even a lot of undergrads who signed up and hopefully are here listening to this right now. Um, and, and they all ask some version of the, the following question. Um, what can they be doing right now as early career scientists to help communicate good information about COVID-19 more effectively? Do any of you, I'll just open this up to any of the four of you, do any of you have thoughts on how early career scientists and budding science communicators can be involved in having a positive impact on this, this line of communication? I guess. Uh, Cheryl, yes. <laughs> I would say probably the most effective thing so many of us can do, you don't have to be early career, but every single one of us, every single person watching um, has more, uh, will, ha will be trusted more by their friends, their family, their community than any of us on this panel, than journalists, than the politicians telling us we need to maintain social distancing. So if you have the expertise in science, if you understand a little more about what's happening than folks outside of your discipline, then this is your opportunity to have influence and have those important conversations with them and share information. And I know it might not feel like you're on the, the national stage uh, having that influence necessarily right now, but we never know how things will trickle out. So I think making time for the people in your life that do need information, I mean, I do this with my parents every day uh, and their friends and the forwards and emails that they're getting that don't make so much sense. I, I really think that's so valuable and inherently important to better communication around this pandemic. Teacher or Dominic, are there research data on the impact that people have speaking to friends or family as opposed to hearing it from professional scientists or science communicators? So I guess I'll start again and you know it brings us back to what we we're talking about at the beginning of the conversation that that notion of 
the trustworthiness of the messenger. And, you know, in risk communication 101, we always say, you know, the messenger is more important to some extent sometimes than the content of the message itself. So the same message by two different messengers will be perceived very differently by people. The same information will be processed differently, the same. Uh, so we need to be careful of who convey that information. And very often, you know, in your social network, you're going to have more power than somebody that's external and that's not, uh, uh, you know, perceived as having a direct relevance to someone's life. So I would concur, like research would tend to say that you can be very powerful in your social network if you are trusted, again, if people will uh, tend to, to listen to you because they think you are someone that can be trusted. And, and there is, I think, jumping off of what Dominique said and, and, and also looping back to something that Marin said earlier with Steph Curry, that there is research that shows that, that, that especially information that, that doesn't fit our prior beliefs, things that we may not want to believe, and I think COVID is a good example, um, or certain aspects of the virus and, and the behavioral interventions that are necessary, that that information tends to flow most effectively and be adopted if it comes from trusted, close family friend sources. Solomon Messing has done that work when he was still at Stanford. He's now at Facebook, I think. Um, but there's there's some really good work that that suggests that. And I think that's the other thing to your to your jury to your question or to the question that so many asked. If you think about communication with even a small network that you have, and for some, I think young scientists, that's a, a pretty big network in, in in on social and elsewhere. Uh, but even a small network, the parallels to the virus are actually really interesting because if you if each of us just reach, reaches a network that is fairly unique, that message spreads pretty far. And, and Marin said earlier, you know, if Steph Curry says something, those are people that he's reaching that I would never be able to reach. Um, and I, but I think at a smaller scale, that's true for all of us. So, so seeking that conversation, reaching to people that you either know or even don't know on social, I think is... is is cumulatively really is where the effect comes in. It's even if it doesn't seem for any given communication all that effective, but cumulatively, I think there's really a, an effect that, that that hopefully will be will be uh, measurable. Great. And Marin, do you have anything to add to that? Any advice for for budding scientists or science engineers about how to have an impact with science communication? Yeah, I would say um, be a fact checker be a fact checker for your network whether it is whether your network is uh, fellow scientists or students or lab members or family members um, as many people as we can have out there tamping down misinformation making sure that the information gets spread it can be in conversations it can be in facebook you can do it on twitter if you've got the courage you can can start a blog i think some people still blog um, anything that that pushes the the good information a little further along. And I think a really important thing to remember in this is that when we talk about misinformation and disinformation, I think we have this, uh, this sort of mental image of bad actors coming from outside. But a lot of the misinformation that's yeah. circulating right now is, be is being circulated with the best of intentions. You know, people are, do are pushing things along because they want to help. And there there's micro examples of that, like the meme that went around Facebook a a week or a century ago that had some, was, you know, take small sips of water, it will wash the virus out of your airway, as well as, and, and there's, there's also big um, subjects that people are confused about, like hydroxychloroquine and mask wearing and, and uh, getting correct information into any of the networks that are dealing with either those micro errors or the macro errors would just make a huge difference right now. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think it was, um, Someone, one of the panelists can correct me if they know more about this. I think Liz Neely of Story Collider has, a, has written some pieces about where she talks about the nerd node of trust, right? Is that the term she uses, which is the person in your family or your social group who everyone goes to for that scientific information. So I think what you're all saying is be that person. So great, thank you. Um, well, I, I'm going to open this can of worms that I maybe shouldn't open, but I'm going to do it anyway, because we got a lot of questions about the idea of experts and expertise and public trust. So um, why does the public trust of expertise seem to be so severely challenged right now? And what can be done about that? Um, Dietram, I see you smiling, so I'm going to start with you. Yes. So um, I think Dominique earlier kicked it off by talking about the knowledge deficit model, this idea that if we just throw more information at people, um, the world would be a better place. 
um, or the knowledge deficit model. Sometimes people have, have deficits in information. I think that we need to be very careful to not go into the next deficit model, and that is the trust deficit, um, and assuming that, that experts are not trusted. There's a couple things that are really important. One is scientists remain among the most trusted groups um, in this country, certainly in the US. I know many people are listening from elsewhere. Um, but while most institutions have lost public trust, ranging from Congress to industry to whatever else, uh, scientists have actually maintained that. Um, there is some, there are some arguments that, that breaks down differently across partisan lines, but if you look, for example, at the latest polling that's come out from YouGov on, on the CDC um, and, and, and public trust, uh, that's actually the one institution that enjoys very high levels of trust, four out of five Americans among Republicans, among Democrats, among independents. So clearly, the idea that, that um, there's a general erosion in expertise, um, I think, is not correct. What, what I think all those questions are getting at correctly, though, and, 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 and I think rightfully so, is a competition between political actors and scientific actors over having the public's ear during this during this crisis. Um, and I think this is one that we're seeing uh, playing out in real time. Uh, I think this is, I think we're living in a very interesting time politically. Um, that's one reason for that. Uh, but I think the other reason for that is, is that this is an issue that from the beginning was in, an issue that of course had political implications. We knew that if we closed the country, and the Italians have said this very explicitly, partly they got into the situation that we're in, because they couldn't fathom the idea of closing down the country and closing down the economy. And that's not an unreasonable concern to have. To, we have to balance not just minor evils, but major evils against one another. Um, a, a, an economic crash um, and, 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 uh, versus, versus a, a deadly disease versus invasions of on privacy. I'm not sure how many of you saw your, your cell phones light up during this call that now Google and Apple are, are gonna are gonna build software into their phones to, 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 to let you know if you've been in contact with somebody who is infected. All the privacy um, government overreach questions that come from that. So long story short, the, the expertise becomes something relative given to what questions we're tackling. Um, and I think that the problem is that we're, as we're moving along, we have to balance a lot of different societal, ethical, scientific considerations. Um, in, in, in my community, we call this a wicked problem, right? A problem that doesn't have a best solution. If, if there was one, uh, this would be great, but it doesn't have one. It will require those trade-offs. And I think this is, where the, this is where the issue comes in, and this is why expertise um, is really relative to any, to any given question. But that, that idea that we have a general decline of trust and expertise, um, at least the numbers don't bear it out, but I do agree with the premise of the question. Thanks, Dietram. Cheryl, I'm going to I'm going to bounce this question over to you now because I think you and I discussed this a little bit in our conversations leading up to today's session. So, what are your thoughts on this question of the the public, the seeming degradation of the public trust and expertise, and what we can do about that? Well, I want to make a distinction between what Dietram was just talking about, which is public trust in scientists, engineers. I mean, that is as high as it's been uh, from everything I've seen. But we're also in a situation where we're communicating in ways we haven't in previous decades when a lot of the institutions we depend on were set up. So we're not quite up to date with dealing with where we are with COVID-19. Uh, and at the same time, anyone with an audience and a platform can tell us they're an expert. And we see this well beyond the coronavirus, right? We see this with genetically modified foods, uh, climate change. Uh, we see, I'm seeing this a lot in my work with plant-based alternative meat substitutes because there's a big pushback on that. So it's not something immediately new that now we're dealing with with this virus. Um, but it is a real problem. And I think that we're not necessarily, as I said before, um, it's not a problem where we're doubting the scientists, but we're turning to the wrong self-proclaimed experts for guidance. And uh, without going into tremendous detail and taking up all the time we have now, because I could talk about that for the next two hours, um, two books that I'll recommend, and Dietra, you might not like the title of one, but uh, The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols and The Triumph of Doubt by David Michaels are two books that I think are excellent, uh, and I would highly recommend to anyone watching. Thanks. Marin or Dominique, anything to add on this question of uh, public trust and experts and expertise? Yeah, I mean, I, I, just to, to follow up on what Dietrich was saying is like some the term that we like in sociology of science is that notion of post-normal science. 
is the science that's not the everyday science that you produce in lab and then goes to the public and so on. In the context of post-normal science, like things that actually have ethical, legal, uh, economic implications and that go out just of the science, of making the science, the notion of expertise becomes very blurry. So this means it's not just the scientists as we tend to think of scientists, but economists are experts and, you know, and, and uh, the potentially, you know, like all the actors that are in, the, all the stakeholders that have something at stake in whatever is developed in that post-normal science context need to have a, a representation of their own expertise. And that was gets complicated because what, when people say, oh, you know, is there like, you know, a problem with expertise? What expertise are we talking about? Well, I think the public health expertise right now is actually doing a pretty good job. Yeah, the fact that they're not doing maybe not a, such a good job is how they can interact with the other type of experts we need because this is a global crisis that has multiple dimensions. So the trick to going back to what Shaoyi was saying, can we have institutions that are prepared when you have global crisis like such as this, it's, uh, that one, that is not just scientific, but economic and so on, as uh, uh, Marin and Dietram was saying, how can we have all those experts working together to have a common from in communicating? So see, there's different levels. Number one, what type of expertise? Number two, what's the common message? And number three, how can this can be communicated? Going back to the point of we need institutions that are able to do that. And obviously, we're not going to define all this right now in the crisis, but hopefully it's going to give us some lessons as how to move forward in the future. Thanks so much. And Marin, any thoughts um, from a journalist perspective on this question? It's such a difficult question. I, I have know. no That's answers. why I saved it for last. <laughs> I, I have no answers, um, but I'm intensely interested in how we're working through this. I think one of the big challenges for journalists right now uh, is explaining to our various audiences that not all, not all experts are equally expert. Right. It, it, it's not just the, the challenge is not just a question of here's someone with 17 degrees and a right. name chair at a university versus, uh, you know, a, a guy with a medium post. It's that there are two people with 17 degrees and a name chair at a university that disagree and only one of them can be right. You know, and it's, I've been talking to people a lot the past couple of weeks about the question of masking in public. Uh, about which everyone has an opinion, everyone wants to do something in part because it feels like a positive action, right? It feels like you have agency, like there's a thing that you can do, but the science is insufficient and contradictory. Just yesterday, within a half hour of each other, the British Medical Journal came out with a, a study and an editorial that said, we probably should mask in public, it probably can't hurt. And the National Academies of Sciences came out with a, a rapid communication that said, there really is no good evidence for this. Mm -hmm. Within 30 minutes, I think it was, I counted, I think it was actually 18 minutes of each other. You know, <laughs> what is the public to believe? And how right. do we, how do we uh, communicate that those disagreements among people whom we would think are equivalently expert uh, and not have the, the mass audience just throw up their hands. Yeah. Well, you, we are just about out of time, but I, I do want to ask one last question for each of you. We started on a positive, and so I'd like to end that way. Um, and I'm going to ask you, if you can, one sentence answer to this. I know that's an unfair request to make, but, um, but each of you, um, who or what gives you hope about the way science is being communicated right now? Dietram, let's start with you. I'll... I'll end with how I started. I am extremely excited is maybe the wrong word given what we're the situation that we're in. But this is the first time that I think we're we've managed to connect individual action and social consciousness, people actually caring about the collective, uh, which is something that I have not seen for a long time in the debate surrounding vaccines and infectious diseases, and at least on public discourse rather. Um, and I think that's very heartening. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, if, if there is any silver lining, I think that's it. Great, thank you. Dominique? Well, so Dietram talked about the societal level. I'm going to also bring it back to the beginning at the local level. I think, you know, it's very uh, uh, enlightening and very hopeful to see how communities are coming together and, you know, like I'm bringing together all the good in the community to actually help this move forward. And we're discovering something that we've looked at in sociology, that notion of social capital and how it's important for community uh, to, to be together and, and, and cultivating the ties in the community to solve a crisis. Thank you. Aaron, how about you? Something that gives you hope? Uh, I was 
talking to an editor yesterday about planning for the rest of the year. Uh, and she made the point that every, every beat now is coronavirus. Whether you write normally about economics or about food or about schools or about urban planning, as well as about science and medicine, coronavirus is the only story there is for the foreseeable future. There has been nothing in my working lifetime that was like that, uh, where every story, every outlet, every reader, every member of the audience was focused fundamentally on what really are questions of science. Um, I would never say that this pandemic is a good thing, but it is, it is fascinating to me. And I think we're going to learn a lot from the ways that people uh, gain information, the decisions they make about what they listen to, um, the, the way they uh, pass information to other people in their network as we move through this, so that it's, it, it's going to be a, a really fascinating experience to have. Absolutely. I agree with that very much. And Cheryl, we'll give you the last word. Who or what gives you hope right now with, with, with respect to science communication? What gives me hope is the speed and the global collaboration related to both science and science communication around the pandemic. And while it has revealed the cracks and the failures of the institutions that we have, I'm hoping that when we emerge from this, it gives us the opportunity to repair and replace what's not working so that ideally we emerge more equipped in science, science communication and geopolitics broadly to meet the challenges ahead. Fantastic. Well, what gives me hope is that we have wonderful people like you working on, a, on all of this and we have a huge population out there of people who are curious and wanna learn more. And, and so I wanna thank all of you for tuning in today and listening to this and I especially want to thank our four panelists for doing such a wonderful job. We really appreciate everything you're doing, uh, everything you're continuing to do. So thank you all for being a part of this. Um, I just want to finish with a couple of business items. I want to encourage everybody who's listening to please check the Duke Science and Society Initiative website to get more information about the work we do here at the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, to learn about our Masters of Arts in Bioethics, Tech Ethics, and Science Policy program and to RSVP for our upcoming coronavirus conversations. And just a last note, which is that our next event, our next coronavirus conversation event, will be next Monday, April 13th, 1230 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll be discussing medical supply shortages and rationing decision-making with Duke experts, Peter Ubell and doc Dr. Peter Ubell and Dr. Monica Lemon. So with that, I wanna thank everyone. Thanks again to our panelists and, um, and look forward to having further conversations like this. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.